welcome. Kings of War is back on the menu, and the Abyssal Dwarves have taken to the field in the biggest Kings of War points level that I've ever participated in for a tournament. 3,000 points of red-hot, spicy, succulent, tender, moist Abyssal Dwarf goodness on the battlefield. So, hello everybody. Boom, there's my army. 3,000 points. Doesn't take up a huge amount of space considering it is at such a high point level. So, this is TT Tournament 4, uh, Bring Out Your Dead, which took place today. So, as soon as I got home, I started preparing this. Not just because I'm a beast and I can go into activate beast mode and just endless content flowing out to you no matter how tired I am, but it's kind of by necessity because there's also a Kings of War tournament tomorrow, which I'll have to report on as well. So, I don't want to create a backlog of content, so let's get this one rolling. We've got Syndra in the chat there. Hello. Okay, anyone who's watching this live, don't forget to like, obviously, as you should be doing anyway. Okay, here is my army. Let's go through my list, shall we? Because it's 3,000 points, so obviously it's more open than usual. There's more stuff that you can take. You can take four of things rather than just three, which I haven't done anyway. Uh, you may notice that there is four of something, but that's not the kind of unit that's generally restricted anyway. So... Let's start with these two units right here. Two Immortal Guard Infernal Warden units, which means that they get the crushing strength, but they don't have to lower their defense for it, which is good, because a lot of units do have to lower their defense when they gain crushing strength as an upgrade. So they're pretty tasty. And I'll at the end, I'll go through the kind of thoughts behind the theme of the list and special rules that lots of the units have in common that's going to make it difficult to deal with for certain enemies. So, we've got four troops of gargoyles. I specifically painted up two more. I only had two. Got two more ready just for this event, because I knew it was going to be 3,000 points, and I wanted more gargoyles. They're one of the best chaff units in the game. And how can you go wrong, really? They fly, speed 10. They even have regeneration, not that they get to use it very often. But the width of them as well is perfect for sitting them in front of a cavalry unit, for instance, if you're covering your advance. So, yeah, they're just really good. And for only 85 points, I've got four of them in there, so hopefully that should help me control the battlefield a bit. Which is a theme with this list, that's what I'm going for. I want to control who my opponent can fight and how many of their units can fight as well. That's the thinking. And the reason that I decided that was a good route to go... Well, I have been running a faster Abyssal Dwarf list recently anyway, but at the Masters, the other Abyssal Dwarf player there was using a lot of half-breed champions, and I felt that they were able to control their games quite well from what I was observing, so that's why I've got three of them down here, and Bracky, who is like a super half-breed champion, so four of them in there. So being individual, they can just go and cause havoc, get into little crevices that other units can't, and hopefully be very difficult to deal with. Then, we've got one horde of lesser obsidian golems, just because at this point level I'm running out of units to stick into the army. It was either going to be them, or maybe some decimators. And I don't feel like decim decimators would have complemented this list too well, because everything else is really fast and is going to run off and hang out on an objective, after killing things maybe, or just get onto flanks and murder things. Whereas the decimators are mostly good at staying put, and my staying put section of the army is these two units, potentially, and the golems. So if there's an area of the table I just want to deny, and just put them there to not get killed before the end of the game, maybe if there's a, a forest or something to put them in, that's the plan for the golems, to make them very difficult to kill with their defense six, and just to block up an area of the table. Then... We have got two regiments of half-breeds, one of them, this one here, has Blessing of the Gods, so they're elite, and this one has Sir Jesse's Boots of Striding, so once per game they can have Strider. Then we've got two hordes of Grotesques, this one here has the Mead of Madness, which gives them plus one to their charge distance, and they're just pretty tasty, no upgrades on the other unit. 
preserving points there. There is a hex caster here, but I think he's actually hiding behind the gargoyles for this photo. I don't know what he's doing all the way at the back there. He should have been down here at the front. So the hex caster has hex weakness and the periscope, so we can see above my infantry units and not be seen by enemy infantry. So if I put him behind the immortal guard, that's the plan. And with hex having 30 inch range and potentially doing damage with it, it's not just for targeting enemy wizards. It can also be tasty against other units and weakness is pretty self-explanatory. Just makes my units more survivable by bringing down the crushing strength of the enemy. <clears throat> then as I move on to page two of my list, well, that's where the Half-Breed Champions and Bracky are. No upgrades on any of them. I know you can get some good value out of putting certain items on them, like there's the, the one that gives them Duelist, and the ones that gives them uh, D3 extra attacks against certain unit types, but I haven't gone for any of those, just keeping them nice and cheap. Then two Grotesque Champions, one there and one there. With no upgrades on them at all, I think they're just fine as they are. If you've got five points left over, then Blade of Slashing is always a good choice for them, because they have a lot of crushing and you can usually get them into a good position because they don't have a very wide frontage. The other unit here, this chariot, this is the special event uh, unit. I didn't really have time to make a <coughs> to make a zombie cart for the army, unfortunately. I would have liked to, but I've been very, very busy painting, among other things. So this is just my Easter-themed chariot that has a bit of a bunny pulling it. So this is the zombie cart, and that is shambling, it's slow, it's got a shooting attack, it's got a few attacks. It's shooting attack, does have blast d3. So it's not bad, and it has cloak of death and dread, I think, as well. So that's quite cool. Now, what is the common theme among most of these units? Well, they are pointless to waver in combat. There is a lot of fury. So, if we look down here, these two can't be wavered at all, the Immortal Guard. The Golems can't be wavered at all. The following units have Fury. Grotesques, Grotesque Champion, Half-Breed Champion, Bracky, Half-Breed Champion, Half-Breed Champion, Grotesque Champion, Grotesques, Half-Breeds, Half-Breeds. So virtually the entire army does not care about being wavered in combat. So my plan is obviously to get into combat, because if they're shot and get wavered, Fury doesn't help you that much. Gargoyles can still be wavered, but... If, if they get wavered, they're probably doing their job, because they're mostly going to be parking in front of things. I don't want charging anything else, so being wavered is actually a really good result for them, usually. And I've also got a lot of regeneration, so most of the units have that. The only ones that don't are the Golems, the Hexcaster, and the Zombie Cart special event unit. Well, you'll see it stats in a minute. I've taken a picture of the sheet when we get to that. So that is 3,000 points. And it fits snugly into my case because I've spent so many of those points on these heroes and the Hexcaster at the back there as well. So my thinking is I'm going to get in there, cause chaos, block up enemy units with gargoyles and half-breed champions. If the half-breed champions get charged by anything that isn't a really killer unit, there's a good chance they only get wavered. So that means with their fury they can still counter charge, so they're still involved in the fight when one of the other units joins in. Gargoyles, I'm not going to commit them all at once, most likely I'm going to throw them in one probably one at a time, maybe two at a time, and try and prevent the enemy from getting their powerful units into the stuff I care about, like the Grotesques and the Half-Breed units. And the Grotesque Champions as well, because they're quite expensive. So, let's have a look at game one. Now, this is against the Order of the Green Lady, and the scenario is Pillage. So, in fact, I'm just going to zoom ahead a little bit and find a picture of the army list, and then I'll come back to the deployment. So there is a picture of the list coming up here. So there we go. We have Order of the Thorn. Uh, two of those with Vial of Sacred Water. And it's, I think that's the one that's a bit like a healing brew and also makes you or gives you a sacred water keyword, which allows other things to jive with them particularly well. So they're kind of similar to Immortal Guard, but of course can be wavered, but they do have Headstrong. So yeah, they are quite similar. Uh, they've got good defense. Uh, my Immortal Guard obviously have Crushing Strength, but these are a bit cheaper as well. So that'd be the most similar unit. Two Order of Redemption Knights. One with the Brew of Sharpness, so it's sitting on twos, and one with Blessing of the Gods, so it's elite. With Crushing One, Thunderous One, so they're quite dangerous. And Headstrong is represented quite heavily here. 
I'm also keeping an eye out for Pathfinder and Strider, because I've got quite a bit of Strider in my army, so if I can get the, the fights into the terrain, I'm going to have the edge there if I don't see much Strider or Pathfinder opposite me. Then we've got Order of the Forsaken Cavalry Horde. So they're speed 10, so they're the fast cavalry, and they also have the boots of striding. They've got thunderous charge one, crushing one as well, and they fly. So this is a big flying cavalry unit, large cavalry. Then we've got woodland critters. Now, you would feel bad, wouldn't you, killing anything that's called a woodland critter? My arrow has turned into a giant hand temporarily, by the way, but that's because I've zoomed in on the list so we can read it better. I'm sure it'll revert back to the old familiar reassuring arrow in a minute. The Beast of Nature, so that's speed 10. This is actually quite dangerous unit, but it is expensive, over 200 points for a flying monster. Seven attacks, so it'll be looking for flanks mostly, presumably. And it has Vicious, which is nice, crushing strength too. <clears throat> a Pegasus, which is similar, but it's just chaff. It's nowhere near as good stats, only three attacks, and it can do a bit of damage. So is it better than a Gargoyle unit? Because it's five points cheaper. It's got better defense, it's got a better melee stat, it's just got way less attacks and it doesn't have regeneration, but it does have thunderous and it takes up less space. So in some situations it's better than gargoyles, but for the role I'm using the gargoyles in, I think I would rather have them because I want to fill more space. Then we've got Devoted, the hero infantry, spellcaster with conjurer staff for re-rolling one of the casting dice, and heal and bane chant. So that's going to be something to watch out for. Then there's Avatar of the Green Lady with heal 6. So again, quite a lot of heal here. So I'm going to have to be careful to kill units and not just do chip damage on them. And then we've got the Exemplar Redeemer, who is a large cavalry hero on a winged unicorn with hand sanguinary scripture, which gives life leech 1, which is represented there. So the other half of the list Champion of the Green Lady. Now, normally you'd think, well, that's the end of the list there, but no, this is 3,000 points. There's a lot of stuff here. Champion of the Green Lady, a cavalry hero, seven attacks, dash 15, so that's pretty good for an individual. The kind of fights you want to get in with them are often into units that have a lot more attacks than them, so not being able to waver is a, a good strength for the unit there. Rallying, which is good for sacred water only, so certain units are going to benefit from that. Two... Water Elemental Hordes, one with Brew of Haste, one with Mead of Madness, so they are brought up in speed a bit there. And a Greater Water Elemental as well, so Crushing Strength being thrown around on these. We've got some good regeneration. And Wild Charge as well, which makes them pretty quick when you combine that with Brew of Haste and the Mead of Madness as well, so they're actually pretty fast. Then Devoted, uh, the Lurkers in the Lake Hero, that's a Spellcaster with Surge to use on the Elementals and Mind Fog 2. Mind Fog is good for just forcing a nerve check, so if you've got a, a unit that's damaged late on in the game, that can be handy. So let's go back to the deployment and see what we're looking at here. So, the tokens, we've got one up there, we've got one here, or we've got one here, or one here, and I should say they're objectives by the way, not tokens. We've got one under there, and one under there. So when I was placing the objectives, I was uh, mostly putting them... I think I put quite a few in the middle, and I believe my opponent was putting them away from the middle, if I remember correctly. So I've actually got, because I ended up choosing this side, I've got Immortal Guard on an objective already, and the Gargoyles here. So my plan, I've put the bulk of my heavy hitting stuff towards this side of the table ever so slightly. Because if you notice on that side, I've got gargoyles as the bulk of the force there, and there's a bit of impassable terrain there as well. So I'm not too concerned about these two tokens. I'm going to focus on maybe if I can keep the gargoyles here and don't have to use them to chaff anyone up, they can just sit on that one for the game. Same for the immortal guard over there. They're difficult to shift, but there will be some enemy flyers that can hunt them down, so I'm going to have to be careful with that. And then if I can hold these two as well, that would be four out of the seven, which would be enough to uh, four. Is it? No, it's six. Yeah, because there's not one dead in the center, so it's just six. So if I can hold four, that would be enough to win. So that's my plan. I'm not too concerned about these two. So on this side, I've got one of my half-breed champions in the gargoyles behind the building. 
And really, there's a lot of enemy flyers that are more dangerous than my flyers. My flyers are all gargoyles, which are of course terrible at fighting, and just chaff. So against things like Beasts of Nature, and these flying knights, and the flying hero there, and the Pegasus, I'm kind of thinking about using my half-breed champions as a bit of a deterrent. So that one out there. Gargoyles there. Gargoyles behind my lines. I don't want them uh, getting hit by anything too early. And I can just dive out in front. Hexcaster next to the Immortal Guard since he can see over them with the periscope. Half-breed champions over there. And grotesque champion here behind the woods because it can just go through the woods without any issue with charging due to Strider. Golems next door. So they're going to go into the terrain and they might just hang out there and see if anyone wants to charge them with their defense 6 in terrain. I've got Bracky is this one here with the shield, the half-breed with the shield and there's a standard one next to him. My corpse cart special event unit is there and I think there is a picture of that, the rules for that coming up at some point. Then we've got half-breed regiment there, another one behind, as backup and the other gargoyles behind the grotesque units and a grotesque champion, immortal guard and another half-breed champion out on the flank. So I've gone pretty wide across the table, which you can do at 3000 points. And here is my opponent's army, so we've got the infantry there. These guys do have phalanx and most of my army is cavalry and flyers, so I don't want to hit them in the front ideally, but they're not that resilient anyway. They're decently survivable, but they're not like a mega defense unit. Like if it was a, a horde with phalanx, then I'd be more concerned because even a multi-charge into a big horde like that, that would be an issue. I think if I can get multiple charges even in the front of this unit, I think I would still be okay. Some flying threats on this side. So I'll tell you about my plan to deal with them as it comes up. They've got the Beast of Nature, the Woodland Critters, the Water Elemental, the Hero on a Horse there. The other water elementals and some casters behind. That's the avatar of the green lady there. Uh, you live viewers, you haven't liked this video yet, you heathens. There is the zombie cart for the enemy and some knights in the difficult terrain and some more knights out there. So, there are the objectives that we're fighting over. And yeah, there's the list. And here is the zombie cart. So, movement five. It's on fours, ranged fours as well. Unit strength is zero, so you can't use it for objectives or that kind of thing. Height three, which is cavalry height, attacks three, defense five, dash 14. So it's quite survivable. Crushing strength one, shambling, life leak two, dread cloak of death, and it also has blast D3 on its shooting attack, which is 12 inch range. So my opponent is going first and immediately is looking up and hiding behind this building, this destroyed building with the Pegasus. So I can't really see it with anything that can charge it, so it's maybe waiting for the opportune moment to get behind my lines if I start abandoning this flank with maybe this guy, because he's one that could just turn around and charge it. Or maybe it's acting as a deterrent to me uh, moving up. I don't know if I can actually see anything yet, so I think it's just a staging post where it wants to move to in the next turn. Let's see, in the chat, Syndra says, I have a friend who usually fields two lesser golems with an iron caster with heal and surge as a strong center, tries to devastate flanks with grotesques. How does that sound to you? Well, that's, that's kind of the standard Abyssal Dwarf system, is to have a center of golems with healing and surge. I like to have more than two, I think. Two and a greater golem, or three and a greater golem. And if you're going up to four big surge units with defense six, at that point it becomes worth investing in two casters. And then you have one that's specializing in healing with an item like Shroud of the Saint, I think that still exists. <laughs> and another one that's specializing in surging. So. Just had to cough momentarily there. I've been talking a lot today after playing Kings of War all day as well. So yeah, that's a standard kind of Abyssal Dwarf army. I've gone for a more speedy Abyssal Dwarf force in recent months. So, that is the turn. There's a bit of movement forward, but not a lot is accomplished. And I believe I gave away the first turn to my opponent, rather than taking it myself, because there isn't much shooting coming at me. 
and nothing would be in charge range and I want to have the last turn because I want to be able to decide where I'm going to leap onto which objectives do I want to dive in the final turn. So onto my turn. Half-breed champion up behind this building so nothing can see it just to keep it safe. Again it's a staging post position so technically I can pivot it and charge down this way because it's an individual if anything lands down here. But if not, then I can just move behind and start looking to annoy units and take away their thunderous charge. Everyone else is moving up. I'm not giving up multi-charges. I'm leaving some charges open, some things in range, but nothing... No huge multi-charges, I think. The only one I might be giving up is the grotesque horde here. It may, might be in range of the flying knight and the flying hero. But if they're both going to commit into here, then I'm kind of okay with that. And over here we've got the knights who are hiding behind the hill. So my golems and grotesques can see over the hill, but it's quite a distance already. And you can see that I move this guy down here. So yeah, the knights came up there. So I've moved up and I've not come into their charge range or their sight with any units that they could either see over the hill or, or in the case of these two. Or they would have to go round, like maybe this one could see down here. But I'm staying out of their range. And I've dipped my toe into the woods with these two units, which is quite important. Because now they can charge out of it should the need arise. The Pegasus can't see either of them. I've moved my hero back here. So I was thinking this guy, this Pegasus, would very much like to just flap over and land down here. Then turn and take a flank charge on one of my units. So I'm putting him there as a deterrent. And he's still going to be useful later in the game. It's not essential to throw him away now. So I don't think my opponent is going to want to bring him over here while he's around. Some lovely cinematic over-the-shoulder shots there. Look at that. So not much battle going on yet. I believe I do try and hex because it's a longer range than weakness. One of these elemental units, but it doesn't do much. Turn two for the green lady. So the beast of nature, which was here charges into this unit of grotesques. So this is to pin them in place so that when the units charge in here I can't then immediately flank them. And then that double charge does go in. So this is the only double charge I've left open and like I was saying I really want to just get up there and get murdering and I don't feel like if I put gargoyles out in front that would have been a tasty proposition for the enemy. I think they would have just found a way to kill the gargoyles without having to use these heavy hitters, so I wouldn't have improved my position at all. So, these guys who are charging in are now further away from their slow units, who can move up to here, but we've got this bit of terrain there, so we've got this kind of narrow area that they're going to be coming into and contesting. So they've got limited flank options down this side. I don't have much by way of speed on this side anyway. I'm not worrying about flanking. If I'd put my gargoyles in front here, then this guy would probably be thinking, I'm just going to go and flap my wings and land over there and stare down your flank out of everyone's charge range. Not that this is some great plan, because I don't have necessarily a load of units that are just going to pile in and murder them straight afterwards. But I do not want him to be landing over here. So let's see how it goes. Woodland critters on the hill just blocking in a little bit and then they decide actually you know what we're going to go back instead we don't want to be on the hill we don't want to just get killed that easily. So the grotesque horde does get killed and that's how they position themselves afterwards because as it was the grotesque with its nimble could have flank charged those flying knights which would have been bad news for them so they've gone backwards and this guy has now totally blocked its line of sight anyway. So uh, the, there should be a beast of nature there there's the base. It wouldn't stand up in that position. And a dice tray in the middle of the table, you lose points for that. So what am I going to do from this position? I'm actually going to charge my half-breed champion down into this guy, try and kill him, and then we're going to start off Operation Chaff. So the Gargoyles, for instance, are a good unit to just charge in here and do one wound to them and hold them up. So that's the plan. Let's see how it goes. So you'll notice that I charged in this unit. I think, actually, I think this guy, did he just leave? He may have got out of the way so they could charge in along with this guy by the looks of it. Because I don't think they could all charge here. So I think he ended up kind of over here. 
and then they were able to charge in and then he came in that side. Then the gargoyles did charge into those flying knights, but they didn't do any wounds, which means they can still fly, which is the ultimate nightmare. Very sad indeed, and look, the thumbs down signifies that they did zero wounds. Now, can you rely on gargoyles to wound a defense five unit? No. But you would still like to think it's going to happen, because they hit on fours, so you're going to get five hits, and just one five plus out of those five, and that would have stopped them flying. So on average, you should do it. The grotesques do some damage to the beast of nature, who is actually here. <clears throat> and you'll see that my corpse wagon moved up onto the hill so it could shoot at the woodland critters. I've flown some of the gargoyles out into no man's land there, because that's going to block any charges of these units down into my heavy hitters. The greater water elemental can still charge in there, but I'm less concerned about him because he didn't have as many attacks. So really blocking those two off is the main priority, and I've got Halfbreed Champion behind there as well, and Bracky, and I'm keeping them all out of charge range of these knights. Because I do not want them to come over here, I want them to use up their time and resources fighting on this side, because this is the side I'm not committing as much to. So I want as little as possible to fight in the area that I care about for winning the scenario. So... Uh, so did I accomplish much else? Not really, just a bits of repositioning here and there. On to turn three for the forces of nature. So you can see we've got some angles being marked to see who's in which flank. And these guys do actually have a flank on him, should they choose to take it, because they can flap straight over and go in there, which is not a good time, and that's what they choose to do. So I don't like his chances. And the infantry unit head straight into the Immortal Guard as well. And the other one into the Gargoyles. Uh, the Beast of Nature back into the Grotesques and the Woodland Critters into the Gargoyles, which is going to be a hilarious fight, potentially. And the Greater Water Elemental does go into these Half-Breeds, as you'd expect. I'm quite confident, though, because he doesn't have that many attacks, and at best I would expect him to waver them with his number of attacks, and that's fine because I can still counter charge. And maybe even if I'm able to make space, get two units in to charge him. There's another one right behind here. And we've got a lovely upside down picture of the chariot there being attacked by water elementals. And this unit is hanging back a bit by the looks of things. Dwarven Darkness, yet another spicy tournament report. Yes, it is extra spicy because it's Abyssal Dwarves, who, as you know, are spicy and tender and succulent. So, let's see. Gargoyles are killed here, which is expected whenever they get hit by a stiff breeze. Another lovely upside-down image. You can see that the Grotesque Champion got killed there. And the Immortal Guard do not get killed. But the unit here was my grotesques. Okay, yeah. The grotesques were hit by the beast of nature, put onto seven wounds. That means that you need to roll 11 twice to kill the unit. What does that look like to you? That looks like a 12 and an 11. So the grotesque horde, despite being inspired, has been murdered horribly by a beast of nature. So that is crumping my style a bit. That's one of my hard-hitting units that I was relying on to get some damage done. And they've just died to that. So not looking too great now in this area. So we'll see whether I can bounce back from that. The Beast of Nature is now facing that way, but it won't balance on this pesky hill. So the base is there. The Corpse Wagon takes some damage, but it's not dead. And as I predicted, the Half-Breeds become wavered, so they can still counter-charge with their Fury. The gargoyles become wavered, because woodland critters, it turns out, are terrible as well. And there's the wide shot, slightly blurry this one. So, that is a big hole in my lines now. I don't have any hard-hitting units in this whole chunk, this whole nugget. But the gargoyles will have a rear charge. Uh, they're not a rear charge, they'll have a front charge on there, because these guys chose to look this way rather than that way which is probably wise, because you don't want gargoyles charging your rear. Into my turn, so Immortal Guard versus the enemy infantry. This is just going to keep trundling on for a while, while they slowly chip away at each other. I put the half-breed champion who was off to the right, and the gargoyles into the front, so both of them in there. 
And I think I've got them up to, about, is that a seven or something there? Can't see it from this angle because it's on a bit of a tilt, but I don't kill them anyway. And now this is a risk because obviously if they counter charge the half-breed champion and kill him, they can overrun into the immortal guard. It's a risk I was prepared to take because I think without their thunderous charge, maybe they're more likely to waver him. So I'll take my chances there. And I thought it was a good chance to actually kill them or do good damage to them anyway. The corpus wagon on the on the elementals does two damage. My half-breed unit. So who was in that position there? Let's go back. That was the beast of nature. So it's this unit here that have killed the beast of nature, I think. Which is nice. And now they're staring this way, waiting for this unit to free itself up. I do 10 wounds to the greater elemental because I put, I think it was Bracky in the flank and the half-breeds in the front. Half-breed champion decides to throw itself into the knights. I think it was around here. Straight into the knights and does three wounds, take away the thunderous charge and block them off. And then these gargoyles just flap all the way over here and land in front of the other knights, which allows me to advance with my other units, but keeping them outside of the Pegasus's sight so it can't flank charge them. So my grotesque champion is now going to be in range to hit something next turn. These guys probably will be as well. And I've got both units of knights blocked off for a turn at least. So I'm feeling much better about this area. Those guys could charge into my golems. I don't know if that would go well for them. I think the golems are slightly better than them. And they're not wounded yet at all. And they've got backup with the grotesque champion as well. I'm less confident on this side where I lost that unit. But I still do have a lot here. Turn 4 for the green lady so these guys who were about here they charge into the half breed unit the infantry off continues i think these guys counter charge the gargoyles do they no they counter charge him yes they spin around hoping to kill him and overrun and kill them and look at all those wounds that come back on the greater elemental so i think it regens on a four so it regened like seven wounds back so that's really good and then this unit had some wounds added back to it as well. And here we go. So the elementals into the golems. This is what we want to see. The knights also get some wounds back and they counter charge the half-breed champion. And I think that's their sacred water there. But you can see wounds are popping back because there's, I think there's radiance of life somewhere. And there is plenty of healing to go around. So the units that I didn't kill are getting a lot of wounds back. So six damage done on this half-breed champion, so he lives, does not die, and that's very good news because he's now not going to be overrun. And it also means that these guys are going to get rear-charged by gargoyles, which is amazing, unless the gargoyles get killed by something, which they may do, because I think this guy went in there, but he didn't actually kill them. So they now have a rear-charge open, which is great. Half-breeds also don't die. And up here... Now, who was there alongside the corpse wagon? Let me go back. That was nothing. So yeah, that was just his wounds being taken. Take some more, but he's still okay. The half-breeds get wavered by the greater water elemental again, which is fine because they have fury, so they can keep getting wavered in combat all day and just keep swinging. And the woodland critters and the gargoyles continue to fail killing each other. So these elementals actually do zero wounds to the golems, so they are not long for this world, I would hazard a guess. The half-breed champion gets killed by the knights, and the gargoyles get killed by the other knights, who then overrun, so we've now got to deal with both of these threats. I don't have that many chaff units to deal with them, so what I'm going to do is probably block in one of them and cast weakness onto the other one. So you'll see what my plan is in a moment. Turn four. So this is the flank over here. You can see that the rear charge of the gargoyles, front charge of the half-breed champion is enough to kill those flying knights and this battle rages on. And the gargoyles then turn around to face this way. The half-breeds steam in there of the counter charge, do some damage in return. The corpse wagon does some more damage to the elementals on the hill. And the Greater Elemental is now dead. The Half-Breeds and Bracky finish that off. The Woodland Critters are dead. The Gargoyles kill that. So the Gargoyles are now free to do something else next turn. And yeah, we're just mopping up some units. So I turn this guy around to face the Knights on the hill. And I've also cast Weakness on them. 
with the hex caster and I put the other half breed champion in there to block up the knights. So uh, you also notice that I did murder those elementals that were wild enough to charge into the golems with this guy by their side because he just flanked and now he's able to turn and face that way. And I've moved my mortal guard backwards towards the objective because I don't feel like I've got enough gargoyles left to go for them so I'm going to have to start thinking about those objectives now. So state of play. Uh, my opponent's last turn wasn't very successful killing wise and my turn here was quite good. We've killed that massive unit there, big unit there as well, the greater elemental and we've still got things chaffed up and I've still got gargoyles and half-breed champions running around like lunatics blocking things in. Still got two units of gargoyles only lost one of the half-breed champions so far, because Bracky's there as well. And it's looking pretty good. It was looking terrible when the Grotesques died here, but it's swung round in my favour again now. And I'm struggling to see what the best course of action is here for the enemy. Now, these knights are a really interesting one. Because what I thought might have been an option for them is a charge into this half-breed champion there. They would then hope to kill him because they're make, making a fresh charge and then overrun into the half-breeds who have already taken five wounds. Now, had they done that, they would probably end up hindered on the next part of the charge. So maybe that's a reason not to do it. Uh, but that's what I was concerned the move was going to be. I don't know whether my opponent actually checked the pivot ability to see whether it could go past the grotesque champion. But to me, it looks like they can go down there and touch this guy which is very dangerous so turn five for the green lady infantry war continues the mounted hero which is the green knight miniature which i do now have by the way since gw just brought that back it's a very nice model that's going to go into my old world bretonian army very nice job on it here charges into the half-breed champion there hoping to kill him and then overrun a running theme here, an overrunning theme if you will. The next unit of uh, these guys are in, the elementals are in on the corpse wagon again. And this guy is moving around. I think he is healing someone. They seem to have got some wounds back. So these knights decide to take on the grotesque champion. So I don't know whether my opponent didn't spot that this might be an option, or did check it and found out that they couldn't actually get in there. It's hard to tell from this angle because I'm not directly above, but to me it looked like they would be able to touch him. So I was concerned, but my, maybe my opponent did check it. Possible. And they're going in there, so they may well kill him, because even though they've got weakness on them, they are on a hill, and he's not on a hill, so I think they get more thunderous from that. These ones go into the half-breed champion there. And gargoyles get wavered as a result of some shooting. And this guy gets double wand, which is nice. Let's see, Mega Kanako. I, oh, I'm guessing that's you then. So I checked the angle for night charge on the hill and couldn't get the pivot. Yes, that would make sense. So I was concerned for a minute there, but I didn't want to go and start measuring angles in case you just hadn't spotted it. So, uh, it's, it's a, a fool's double one, if you will, not a true double one. If you're at the stream and you're like filtering out all the, the dice rolls in your little tray and you spot this, you would think, I've struck double one, but no, you actually haven't. It's not a true double one, I just took a picture of it anyway. But a true double one is when a three was required to kill the unit and then you roll a double one. So it's a mini double one. And more damage being dished out back and forth here. Uh, waver and as you know my army doesn't care very much about being wavered so they're just going to be able to counter charge and hopefully kill that unit next turn the corpse wagon is dead finally which means this guy now has some options this unit unless i can get in there with something else but turns and i do have bracky who can charge them i think the gargoyles are wavered so they can't and on the hill, the Grotesque Champion is dead, and they just position themselves so they're not taking a, a heinous flank or rear charge from anybody. And the Abyssal Half-Breed Champion is dead as well. So they've cleared out the chaff, and now I'm going to start killing them with things that I care about. So these golems can make a hindered charge. And so this side of the table isn't looking that healthy anymore, actually. 
I've, I'm doing alright for the objective. All, oh, by the way, my opponent totally forgot here that the corpse wagon doesn't have unit strength, so can't hold an objective. So that's why it's all the way back there. So that would have affected the way the game was played as well. I forgot that it had no unit strength. I was thinking it was unit strength 1 until I actually checked the rules part way through this game. On to turn 5 for me, so what am I going to do here? I've got Gargoyles set up for another rear charge, which is amazing, so that unit should be dead. I've got Bracky, I can do something with him. I can charge both of these units here into the Knights on the hill, the Halfbreeds and the Golems, freeing up Bracky to maybe attack that unit. So the Immortal Guard on this flank, this fight here, they do kill off the unit they were fighting and then they turn around and the reason for being turned at this precise angle. So we've got an objective here and here. If I turned around to face the enemy, he could charge me and I would be stuck there. The best I could hope for would be a shuffle sideways to get to that one and I don't know whether they could have actually made it. I don't know whether they could get close enough with their minuscule movement characteristic. It's possible, but I think a safe bet here is just going side on. So if he lands uh, let's see. If he wants to go there, then I can charge him if I kill him over and onto that one. Otherwise, I can go backwards, maybe onto this one. Um, which actually wouldn't get me any closer than shuffling sideways. So, yeah, because I would rather have this one, I think the th my thinking is. I don't really want this one. This one, I can get with multiple different units. The Immortal Guard aren't going to be in position to fight anyone else, so I'd rather go for this one. And if my opponent wants to use this guy to block them off, then they can just go backwards or charge him, and he's kind of out the game instead of killing something that he could kill quite easily. These two, for example, are heavily damaged. So on the hill, one unit of half breeds just chilling out there while Bracky goes into the elementals. Uh, these gargoyles, which are... let's see what they were doing, I'll just go back a second. It was these ones here. So they've just turned round and faced that way because they are uh, wavered. And these two units do murder the knights on the hill, as you would expect, with a double charge. So that's very nice. Colin is here, the King of Kings. Yes, I am indeed the undisputed King of Kings of War. Not for any particular uh, victory reason, just it's an honorary title, it's not from winning any specific tournament. So, as far as objectives go, it's looking very healthy. I'm going to have these two, probably. I've got this one. And this one is looking good because I should be able to kill that unit by the end of the game. I've got these guys staring down and there's a half-breed champion which is actually Bracky who is unwounded so they're very unlikely to kill him. I should have that one as well. And that is going to be four objectives that should be mine which will be enough to win. So let's see. Into the next round. So this guy decides to charge the Immortal Guard and does some damage to them. I don't know if we've got to that yet though. The Elementals go into Bracky, and yeah, not much is accomplished. Nothing is really killed there. These knights, uh, they killed... Hold on, let me go back. I think I missed it. So I put the Hex Caster here, so that they would be kind of blocked up if I didn't kill this unit. But because I did, I think they did have the option to charge something else, possibly. But they chose to try and kill the Hexcaster, which is the, an easy kill, and presumably that is the reason for it. Um, oh yeah, also my opponent is rapidly running out of time, look at the clock there, we are actually down to zero at the end of this round. So I think maybe the Hexcaster was just quick, you don't have to do any turning or measuring, just blast him straight in there, so that may have been the reason for that charge. If my opponent is still in the chat, maybe we can get confirmation on that, the reason the Hexcaster was attacked. And, yeah, because the time was rapidly running out. So Bracky survived, and can I kill everything now in the last turn? The Immortal Guard counts charge there, because I'm definitely going to win on objectives now. The Gargoyles just land on this one. I keep forgetting to roll the attacks in this combat, by the way. I could have killed this guy already, potentially. Murder with Bracky and the Halfbreeds, the Elementals up there. So we've got this objective, and those two murder the Knights. I can't quite remember the reason for the Hexcaster charge, to be honest. Yeah, I'm looking, and there must be a reason for it. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to guess there is one that would have made logical sense at the time. 
so on to turn seven. There is a turn seven, so my opponent obviously can't do anything because there's no time left on the clock, so I'm just going to try and murder everything. So murder, 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 murder. Everything's dead. Woo, except for the corpse wagon, which doesn't count. So that's maximum points. And a very successful game. Obviously, there was the one major uh, downturn earlier on where the grotesques died. In fact, both the units of grotesques got killed very early. And I was thinking maybe, does my list actually have the hitting power without them? But the answer is probably yes, because the half-breeds hit very hard, the golems can. And all these individuals that can be used as chaff also do hit hard as well, especially in conjunction with other units. The Immortal Guard as well hit fairly hard for a small little infantry block like that. So, yeah, I'm quite happy with the list so far. I was able to block off a lot of units repeatedly and keep them away from my important units for long enough. Oh, we've got a, an opponent live comment here. Thanks for the game, very much enjoyed it. I think the Green Knight failing to kill or even waver the gargoyles was the turning point. Yes, those gargoyles not being wavered so they were able to do a rear charge was definitely huge because that got those flying knights murdered horribly. So that was quite a big deal. The half-breed champs are very good. And I could have run four of them in this list and Bracky. I chose not to. Not for any tactical reason, but because I didn't feel like painting another one that I would never be able to use ever again. Because how often am I going to attend a 3,000 point tournament? and otherwise I can only run three. So I ain't gonna waste time painting one just for one event. Now I took a picture of the delicious meat that was available at this tournament. So very, very tasty meat. There you go, a picture of meat in the middle of a tournament. So if you're looking for succulent and tender, maybe you should sign up for a TT tawny. And now I took pictures of the armies at lunchtime after the meat fest. So there's my army, of course, and I will tell you, after I've shown them all, which one won the best painted award. So there's the army I just faced, the Order of the Green Lady, which doesn't feature the units that aren't fully painted, which is fair enough. It's a slow work in progress, apparently, and it does look very nice, though, especially like the Green Knight there, giving me some ideas on how to paint mine. We've got some ogres. And ogres are an army where I think at 3,000 points you're going to be able to fit a lot of ogres in there. A lot of meat, a lot of big hordes of ogres, just loads of them. So that would be quite scary to face. Look at that. So much meat. Night Stalkers. Now, Night Stalkers, how do I feel about them at 3,000 points? It, that doesn't look like 3,000 points, but it must be. But that looks like a little bit less than 3,000, just to the eye. Obviously the blood worms are very expensive, uh, especially if they're upgraded and big flyers, big monsters. So yeah, I'm sure it is 3,000 points, it just doesn't look like you get a lot. So I will go back to playing my Night Stalkers at some point as well because they are very, very cool. Very nice paint jobs on these ones. I'll tell you which army's got my best painted vote as well. We've got some more ogres and these ones I think I voted this one as my number one uh, best painted vote. Very, very nice flesh tones on the ogres. Very tasty indeed. And some nice classic night goblins in there as well. Isn't that fun? Then we've got some Northern Alliance. Very cool as well. We have got a bit of a mishmash of, I don't know if that's one army there or not. These were just kind of out on the table, so I just took some pictures anyway. I don't know if they were actually open to being voted for. And some more random orc units that I took pictures of as well, because these were so cool. Some classic orcs in there. Look at that. Classic. And more stuff that isn't really laid out. So I'm going to guess that some of the armies that weren't laid out were possibly not painted by the player, maybe. So they didn't lay it out for voting, because they're not eligible. We've got some salamanders. And very cool, very vibrant salamanders. Then we have got what looks like more Northern Alliance. So looking very frosty. And these ones, I'm going to guess these ones are still needing some paintwork. All the others 
Oh, maybe not actually. Maybe it's just they're going for a snow-covered look. I'd have to get confirmation. I don't know whose army this is. But looking cool. Then we've got halflings. Now, I've taken pictures of this army a million times because we seem to appear at a lot of the same tournaments. I haven't played it that many times, but I have played it. And always a fun game against the halfling planes. Let's see. Orc army was borrowed. So, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah, I think borrowed armies are gen or commission armies are generally ineligible for the best painted awards. Okay. And have I just got a random picture of my list in the middle of the video there? Okay, well, that's fair enough. And at this point, uh, who else did I vote for for best painted? Because you had two votes. I'm trying to figure out who else I voted for. Let's see. I know it was this ogre army was one of them. It m could have been the Night Stalkers, because they do look really cool. The Bloodworms are the Ravager Arms, by the way, which are very nice. A very nice use for those bits. So, drumroll, the winner of the Best Army Award was... The Abyssal Dwarves! Woo! My Abyssal Dwarves scooped up the coveted Best Painted Army Award against some stiff competition. Apparently there was only one vote in it, which makes sense. And I do suspect that this ogre army was definitely in contention because this is very, very nice. The only thing that maybe would tip people towards my army is that my bases are quite exciting. They seem to grab people, so maybe that's what won it for me. But the paintwork on these guys is top notch. Okay, on to the next game. So this is Push, and I'm up against Abyssal Dwarves. So we've got an Abyssal Dwarf mirror match. The lists do have some similarities, but not a lot, really. Very, very different feeling Abyssal Dwarf lists, which is nice to see. It shows there are multiple ways to play this army. And there will be a picture of the... Yeah, I just saw Abyssal Dwarves and thought this was my army list. It's not. This is actually my opponent's list, so it is correct here. So, Black Souls, Infantry Horde, with the Fiery Bulwark that gives them Iron Resolve D3, which is very nice. They've got the Hammer of Measured Force as well. So on average, with Vicious, you're going to be getting about 12 or 13 hits. And then you would hope that with the Vicious, you're going to do about 8 wounds. You would hope to get 8. That's the dream. Uh, if you could do 8 wounds every turn, you're getting good value out of them for that upgrade. So obviously you don't want to be hitting crummy units. You want to be hitting the good stuff with the Hammer of Measured Force. Three regiments of decimators, so short range shooting. I'm not too concerned about short range shooting because I've got a lot of stuff that can stand in their way and charge them. So I think that's a fairly good matchup, short rangers. On the other hand, they can spin round and shoot in a different direction, which means potentially they can move out the way of stuff that's in their way, or they can turn round if I'm looking for any flanks. One unit of gargoyles, what an amateurish number of gargoyles that is, only one. Definitely not as good as four. Two Abyssal Halfbreed Regiments with the same upgrades that I've got. Boots of Striding and Elite. So that seems to be the way to go at the moment with these guys. No Grotesques though, but there are two Mutated Mastiff Hunting Packs with Throwing Mastiffs. So they're basically throwing themselves. So they've got a Shooting Attack, which is good and goes quite well with all the other Shooting Attacks here. But they're also decent at fighting, especially against Cavalry. Then we've got two Ancor Heavy Mortars, which is obviously something I need to worry about. Mostly with my units that can't get their health back, so mainly the Defense 6 Golems. Who aren't the ideal target for a Piercing 2 Mortar. Ideally you'd want to go for something Defense 4 or 5, just see Wounding on 2s with Vicious. That would be the dream target, but they're still decent at taking down Defense 6. Then we've got two Iron Casters, one with Diadem of Dragonkind for a million Fireball. 18 to be precise. The other one has heal 3 and the Conjurer's Staff to reroll one of them. And the Hexcaster set up exactly the same as mine. Hex Weakness and the Periscope. Susan and Bracky, my usual combo, but obviously I've not brought Susan this time. Grotesque Champion with Blade of Slashing, which is a good use of 5 points. And the formation of Slave Orcs, so you get the two regiments and the Slave Orc Hero on a beast as well. So they're all fast. They've been given the Brew of Haste and Mead of Madness, and this, this guy gives a 
does he give Wild Charge 2 to the Slave Orcs as well, so they become very, very fast indeed. So, there is the layout. It's push, so there's always a token in the middle. And where are the tokens going to be is the question. Because I've not spread out as much as my opponent has. That's because, well, you'll see I might have something out on the flank, but nothing too significant. On this side, there's quite a hard-hitting unit there, and Susan and Bracky. But this piece of terrain means that it's kind of cut off from the rest of the table. So if there aren't tokens over there, any fighting that takes place over there could be irrelevant to the game. So in the middle, that's where all the shooting stuff is. The mortars there behind, there are the decimators, there's the fireball caster, and there are the two mastiff hunting packs and the hex caster behind as well. So anything that walks in there is going to get shot. But I want to walk there because that's where the token is. So it's a good place to put the gun line. And the cavalry is mostly on this side. In fact, all of it is. All four of the fast cavalry units and the orc hero and Bracky and Susan. So that is a really fast, dangerous, hard-hitting flank there. So if I can divert as many of them away from the middle as possible, that would be good. Because I want to pick up this token and kind of be controlling this area of the table. Because that way I can hope to get my units over the line and deny the enemy units getting over the line with their tokens and the tokens are never going to be put on these fast things really are they that would be crazy and you can only score for one of the tokens that you carry but you can carry as many as you want so you could use a slow unit to shepherd the tokens up the table and then later on drop them and have another unit pick them up so you can score two so uh, where is Bracky? Bracky is the one that's here turn side on so he can go whoop out to about there and I've got my gargoyles hiding behind. They don't want to get shot by mortars or anything because they would just die and I would lose my chaff. I would rather the mortars just hit the golems than that. And there are my little blocks. I've got the immortal guard all the way over on this side on their own. So I put them down there first. And when you do that, obviously your opponent's going to think, well, that unit's going to be carrying one of your tokens over the line then, isn't it? Because it's right on the flank. No one can uh, significant can fit through there. Cavalry can, actually. But you just want to march forward and score with them. Well, I'm not going to let you do that, buddy. I'm going to put all this over here. But really, I wasn't necessarily thinking about doing that. I want all my tokens to be... If I to go back, I want them to be on the wagon. That was my thought, first of all. And then when I found out that actually you can't score all of them, I thought actually the golems could do a good job carrying a token as well because they can't be surged in this list because I don't have any surge casters. And it doesn't slow them down at all. The Immortal Guard are the ones that are likely to pick that one up. So I'm, I want most of my tokens on the wagon. So, you get a good look at my opponent's forces here. Uh, I don't think these were laid out for best painted, so I assume these were painted by somebody else as well. There's the Grotesque Champion and the Gargoyles out on the flank. So I put two tokens on the, my wagon, so I'll have to drop one of them by the end of the game if I want to score more than one. And the other one on the golems. My opponent has put one on the Black Souls horde. And one on those decimators and one on the corpse wagon. So, turn one for me. I believe my opponent gave away the first turn. I think that is how it went. Because not much of the shooting would have been in range anyway. And there we go. So you can see that I've got a half-breed champion right up to the woods, but not in the woods yet. I've pushed everything else up. I've probably gone into charge range of gargoyles, but I'm not concerned about that yet at all. So if they want to charge in, they're free to do so. Gargoyles staying behind, I do not want them to get shot. It's very important they don't get shot. I need them to block up the enemy when I'm actually in range to do something to them and not before. Bracky and the grotesque champion there are hanging out behind the woods, so limited stuff could shoot at them. Half-breed champion there. Immortal Guard, they do a tiny advance, I think not much, because anyone that comes down here to fight them is limited on how much frontage you can get through there anyway. And then they're stuck out here. So the longer the fight goes on, the further away from them I get, then maybe I can drag a combat out with these guys. And I am up then, because the tokens aren't over here, and I'm sacrificing less points in a fight than that unit is worth. So that would be a good goal for me. But you can see there have been uh, some dice put down there. That's because I was marking out the potential charge ranges of these units and I didn't want them to charge into the front of my lines just yet. On to turn two. 
for the enemy Abyssal Dwarves. So what are they going to do? So you can see here that the half-breeds move up, but not into charge range of the Immortal Guard, because that would be silly. And then they're going to start blasting. So what damage do they get done? Two wounds to the golems from the mortars. And that's mostly it. And straight into my turn too. So yeah, not much accomplished in that turn. But setting up, you can see Bracky and Susan are on the hill, eyeing up anyone that comes forward here. And what do I do on my turn? I push a half-breed champion and the grotesque champion into the woods, keeping them out of range of this guy, who can charge them from quite far away. So staying out of their charge range, the grotesque's not in the woods. So if he wants to come into the woods, that's fine. I push things up, staying in the gargoyle's charge range, but nobody else. And what I want to do is, from the safety of the woods, where I would have cover against a lot of this shooting, is then, from here, then charge out and hit the shooting units. My hex caster hexes the enemy iron caster, and then rolls a double six and wavers him. So he had a dilemma, because while you're hexed and you're firing off 18 fireballs, there's a good chance you're going to put yourself into the territory of being killed the next turn, because it doesn't force a panic check when you damage yourself via being hexed. It means you can't move, though, and spell cast. So he would have been in a bit of a pickle, but because I rolled a double six and wavered him, then that pickle has been unpickled, and he just can't do anything now. I've been aggressive with my half-breed champion there. If the enemy want to use all put all their shooting, shooting at an individual, that's cool by me entirely. I've got Bracky a bit further back, so he's ready to steam into something as well. I've got the grotesque champion in the woods, also ready to charge if anyone comes close enough. And the gargoyles are ready behind, ready to swoop, swoop, and block things up as I complete my advance next turn. On this side, I land my gargoyles there. And unintentionally, my plan was to just stop these guys from charging the Immortal Guard. But what I've actually done, because of this terrain, the half-breeds here can't even charge the gargoyles, because the angle they would have to be at, there's not enough space to fit, because the edge of the table is right there. So that's totally unintentional. Well, it says Sigmar dice. Yes, for my nerve checks, I use about 16 different sets of dice from any set of dice that I've got that just look cool and are big. So I've got lots from tournaments, Kings of War tournaments often. In the past, maybe not so much recently, actually, you get dice, a couple of dice to do nerve checks with. So I've got quite a lot of those. And any other set of dice I get, if I've got some left over, I'll put two into my nerve test pile. And then I rotate their use throughout the tournament. So what I was saying here, this unit can now not charge anyone. So the reason this is allowed, because you're not allowed to deny all charges that should be possible with units. So I couldn't position two units in a weird angle that mean that you can't charge either of them. But what I can do is land next to terrain so that you can't fit in there and then you can't charge me. So because they can't fit, they can't charge this unit. So they're kind of stuck there for the time being. Unintentional though, I was really just stopping them charging the Immortal Guard. That was my intention. Everything else is poised, ready to strike. So next turn is when I'm going to make my dastardly approach in full, I think. So we'll see if the enemy do anything to try and counter it before it comes in. Preemptive counters if you wheel. On to the next turn for the enemy Abyssal Dwarves. So Susan charges the Gargoyles. And those guys move back because they don't want to be charged by the Immortal Guard if Susan kills the Gargoyles. So good job for Susan there. And Bracky gets stuck in as well. So immediately I'm thinking, hmm, if they end up in a weird position now, I could kill one and overrun into the other. Wouldn't that be the dream? It's very unlikely, but you never know. Gargoyles into my half-breeds, which is going to lock them down. And then the grotesque champion up behind them, right up touching them, meaning that I can't block it in at all. And also staying in the front of the corpse wagon, so that I can't then go whoop whoop into the flank there, which would be bad times. And this unit cannot see him because they're not in the woods, and the woods are separating them. In the middle, the doggos move forward, and they're going to throw their mastiffs, throw the hunting mastiffs out. So let's see what they do. Over on this side, the cavalry have dispersed a bit, dispersing their formation, because they realise, actually, the main threat is coming here now, because once these charges start going in, I've got a lot of stuff ready to pounce next turn. We need backup. And that is one of the throwing mastiff rolls, I think. Pathetic. So as a result of the mastiffs being thrown and various other shooting, this guy's up to five wounds and he's up to one. 
and then the mortars get the golems up to six and the gargoyles over here are killed by the two very nasty heroes susan overruns so she can't be hit and bracky can be hit so i'm quite happy with that as a turn and in terms of not losing things if anything had been shot off the table it limits my ability to lock things down so what can i do here these two have got a choice something wants to hit that unit because I don't want them charging any of my units. It's a massive horde that's going to do probably eight wounds to anything if it's not hindered. So uh, what I want to do is possibly charge it with gargoyles. If I get the golems out the way, they'll be able to see. I can charge off my half-breed champions and bracky into various things around here. And the grotesque champion, actually, he's planning to charge over the wall into the middle decimator unit. There's just enough space for him to get in there, being nimble as well. And then the others can just hit something else. These knights or these orc cavalry and the half-breeds up there are also a threat that I can potentially be looking at as well. I don't have any charges available down here yet. The enemy do outspeed me and they're on a hill. So we'll see how I deal with that. Uh, three damage on them. Nothing to worry about there. So, on to my turn three. So, the half-breeds steam into the gargoyles and double one them with 14 wounds. Okay, I can live with that. I'll kill the gargoyles at some point probably, but of course they can flap away backwards now and let him charge in, which is annoying. The gargoyles steam in there. They don't do a lot of damage, but I roll another double one, so I thought I should take a picture of it. Half-breed champion into the Mastiff pack does a few wounds, another double one. So even though two of them aren't real double ones, it's three double ones in a row rolled on the nerve dice. Someone tell me the odds for that, because they are astronomical. However, it's all okay because the Grotesque Champion kills an entire regiment of Decimators on his own in one go, and then bounces back a little bit down here so that he's not going to get flanked by anything. Half-breed Champion into the other Decimators up here on the left, they take some wounds and they get wavered, which is nice. Half-breed champ and grotesque champ on the orc cavalry waver them as well, so they're kind of getting in the way now. The immortal guard do 7 damage to Bracky, which is really good. I think they waver him, but that doesn't matter because he's got Fury anyway. And yeah, I'm quite happy about this. I've got my half-breed champion out there, who is looking to stop this unit charging there, I think. They want to charge the grotesques, I can probably live with that because they're not going to kill them in one round. But they may well kill this unit in one round. So maybe I'm underestimating them, maybe they could kill the grotesques, but I think that's the way I'm shepherding them. Then, what else have we got going on here? Anything else worth mentioning before we get into the next bit? Oh yeah, I've got my... Immortal Guard onto the token in the middle now, so they've picked up that token, so they're pushing on with it. And my Golems have got a nice little line here with the Immortal Guard. So as you can see, I've got into lots of the shooty stuff now. Killed one of them, this one's not shooting. Locked down some of the other units, so they're not charging me yet. And having all this chaff, I'm really enjoying the chaff and the versatility of these little cavalry heroes that are just flying into things and blocking them, doing damage. It's quite an enjoyable game experience. For me, I don't know what it's like for my opponents having all this annoying stuff buzzing around them. So on to turn three for the evil Abyssal Dwarves. Susan and Bracky both steam into the Immortal Guard there because the cavalry wouldn't fit with Bracky. There's just not enough space to get them all in there. That was the original plan, but they wouldn't fit. Now, I don't know, would, let's go back a sec, would this unit have killed an unhurt unit of Immortal Guard in one round? What are the chances? They could have had help from Susan, but not from Bracky. Bracky would have had to get out of the way. So with Susan, I would think that would be enough. But with the two heroes, is that going to be enough? They're dash 17, defense 5. So it's going to be dicey, they're not inspired, so you could definitely do it. Mastiff pack into the gargoyles who are planted in front of them to block things in. 
and you can see here that the decimators uh, what do they do hold on let me go back I think this is the shooting that puts some damage on to I can't see whether they've actually killed anyone was there anything there I don't think so oh did this guy get killed maybe I don't know I think he might be still there so I think they just back away a bit the decimators there so the the situation I was talking about with the gargoyles just bounce backwards a bit and then the grotesque champion takes their place in the fight and let's see here so the gargoyles they, they could actually be up there I think rather than down here because it looks like they've just switched places with him I think they could actually be further up there but it doesn't really matter and he steams in there because all they did was move backwards five inches you can see that the special orc character the mounted one goes into my half breeds there this is out on the the center left of the table the cavalry go after my half-breed champion from the hill there. And I don't know whether they could have hit the grotesques or not, but they haven't gone for it. Those guys kind of blocked in at the back there. So the two enemy half-breed units, their most hard-hitting stuff, are both kind of locked out the game at the moment. Which I am very happy with. So if my opponent does not kill much stuff here, I'm going to be free to start charging off all over the place. Now what I was thinking was that when I did this double charge here, and didn't kill the unit. I think it's just because I wavered them. Then I would be in a position where in the next turn I could then crisscross the charges. So this guy charge in there, this guy charge in there, and the grotesque champion can see those over the top, so nimbles to there and then charges them. But because he would have to pivot through my own unit, I wouldn't be able to do it unless the grotesque champion got out of the way. So that's an awkward situation. You can see that the golems have taken more shooting damage. They're really getting up there now. The mortars are doing a good job on them. The ironcaster there has taken a load of damage. Because I think he did a fireball after I hexed him. Which is why he's so wounded now. And he's done some wounds to this guy, I think. Takes more wounds. More shooting is piled in on him. More, even more. And then he gets wavered. So wavered from shooting is not the dream. For most of my units because they have fury so he's stuck there now but he can regenerate and susan and bracky do not kill my immortal guard which is great half breed champion wavered did the absolute dream for them so they can still counter charge these ones not even wavered and the gargoyles wavered by the mastiffs which is okay because they're still alive and they're still blocking the unit in so a few things wavered the Black Souls Horde do kill off the gargoyles there and then do a bit of a cheeky pivot afterwards. So they're now facing this way. So I've got gargoyles that I'd flown up there in the previous turn who would have been looking into the flank and these guys in the front. So they've turned to get them both in the front and we'll see whether I take that on or not. These guys get wavered by the Grotesque Champion, which again is fine. I'm going to be able to hit it in the front and the flank now with my corpse wagon, which will be hindered. So there's the lay of the land. These guys have actually decided they're sick and tired of waiting for this to open up. They're just going to turn around and go back this way. So they've wasted a lot of time. Turn four for me. So double charge into the grotesque champion there. Grotesques into the black souls. I move my gargoyles up here to charge the other mortar, which they kill in one go, which is nice. And some of these pictures were taken rapidly, I think, which is why they're not focused yet. So... My half-breed champion squeezes through some gaps into the corpse wagon and the golems and uh, let's see the golems kill the hunting pack that was there over on this side the gargoyles can't do anything but i've put my grotesque champion into that unit there who they were already fighting i think and i've put one of my hold on let me go back and have a look at that situation before it moves so, uh, these two into there, 
and there we go, they got murdered. So he overruns, and wait a minute, but that's not right. Okay, yeah, I remember what I did. So because of that dilemma I told you about, where these two couldn't do that maneuver, the grotesque champion just had to move away. So uh, this guy had to move away, actually. Bracky. So Bracky moved down here. So he's not fighting anyone. The grotesque champion nimbled round there to lock down that cavalry, and this guy charged off into the flank of them and killed them. Which is the situation you see in this picture here. So he killed that unit in the flank that was already heavily wounded, and I've got these guys locked down with a grotesque champion who is... I think he's unhurt as well, so that's going to be good. I've taken away their Thunderous. And here, just do some wounds there, so they lose their Thunderous as well. You can see Bracky parks in the middle there. Nine wounds onto that hero, which is a really good start on him. And I kill the enemy Bracky with the Immortal Guard, which is great. So they've got more than their money's worth now. And they're now a danger to the enemy. So there's Bracky sitting in the middle. So he's got the free reign of where to charge if I get to use him next turn, if he doesn't get shot by something, for instance. So it's all looking quite good. I've got pieces in dangerous positions ready to strike, and the enemy are running out of ways to deal with them somewhat. Turn four for the enemy Abyssal Dwarves. So the Gargoyles, they flap away a bit, and these guys will be countercharging my Grotesques. The Fireball is attempting to murder me. I didn't successfully hex him the last turn. I, thought, I think all that damage was from last time. I think. Down here, they've moved away from combat, and Susan's going to continue trying to kill them. So they actually realise they want to get involved now. Because all the push tokens are over there. There's one on them, one on them, and all the others are all the way over there. On the right. So they're miles away from the action. Now, the reason I want to keep these units aligned here is because if I push out forward now, they would have a flank charge. If I stay there, but keep them in the flank, the building protects my flank. So that's the plan there. So ideally, this is a, a five inch overrun here. I would actually like that unit to kill this guy and overrun into this unit, because that means I can fight them without moving. So I can fight them right here. They're not going to kill me in one round. And they took damage last turn, so they won't have any thunderous charge. So they're definitely not going to kill this unit. And then I can stay in this position with my flank protected from those guys and still fight them. Whereas if I have to charge off here and fight them, there's a chance that I would just fail to kill them and then get flanked. Or even if I have to turn that way after killing them, I'd still take a charge in the face. I'd rather just not get charged at all, if you don't mind. So, uh, these grotesques get weakened by the enemy hexcaster. And there's a charge, counter charge going on there. This guy gets wavered again in the middle. So he killed the decimator unit and now he's being shot all the time and keeps getting wavered, which is okay because it means the enemy have to keep dealing with him over and over. Otherwise he will eventually snap out of it and do something. But the golems do get killed this time by the mortars. So they've done a good job on that. The gargoyles get shot off as well by a... I can't remember who did it, but some kind of spell or decimators. And Susan does more good damage to my mortal guard but fatally does not kill them so that's very important waver whenever i see that little waver symbol i'm just thinking yes i still get to counter charge you Woo! so they're going to be able to hopefully kill him next turn now and in the middle there that was a i think that was a grotesque champion fighting them yeah it was it, no half breed champion this one here so he died there and then they overrun into the grotesques and they do three wounds so i was actually hoping they killed him and overran in the last turn actually because again i want to stay here because i'm doing well in the area where we're contesting over fighting over tokens so if i can just stay away from these guys that will deter them from marching forward this way so i want to stay here uh, he takes a bit more damage from them, but it's not looking too great for those guys. Because they're stuck out the game as well. My gargoyles get wavered by the hunting pack again. And the grotesques get wavered as well by the black souls. Which I can live with. So where are the tokens? There's a token on my immortal guard there. 
There is a token that I dropped from the golems, which they left there. There are two tokens on him, on my corpse wagon, who you can see haven't killed this guy yet, but they would like to soon. There is at least one on this unit here, and one on the enemy corpse wagon, and one on there as well. So they're all pretty much in enemy territory, which is good for push because you scored double. And there's nothing at all on this side of the table, which is where my opponent has got these three powerful units and Susan all locked down fighting. Turn five for me. So death to the protest champion there. He gets killed. And then I just uh, reposition slightly afterwards. My grotesques into the black souls do some more damage, but not enough. Half-breed champion into the decimators to stop them shooting, does a little bit of damage. Bracky into, hold on, let's go back and have a look exactly what was behind there. So Bracky charged into this hero here. And killed it, and then overran into the decimators here. So charge in, kill, overrun, kill. So there you go, how do you feel about that? Bracky has just cleared out a huge area. Protest Champion does some good damage to them, but not dead yet. And I kill off the hero and the orc cavalry there. And I just reposition to keep these guys in my flank there, because they can't actually contact it because the building's in the way. And they can't hit my half-breeds either, because they're shielded by this unit. And the Immortal Guard do seven damage to Susan and they regenerate a little bit as well. So uh, it's looking quite good. Maybe not this situation here, but there, there aren't a lot of tokens tied up in that situation. Turn five for the enemy. And corpse wagon into my mortal guard who are holding an important token. Uh, this has got one as well. Both units of half breeds into the grotesque champion at the top, just trying to get kill points there. And Susan is gonna try and murder them again. More damage done to this guy, and he's wavered again. So he's still stuck there, but still tying up enemy shooting. And the Immortal Guard out on the flank die. About time, and Susan can now get back involved in the game, but it might be too late for her. Over here, the Grotesque Champion does get killed by the combined forces of these two powerful fighting cavalry units. Gargoyles finally get killed by the hunting pack, the Mastiffs, and the Decimators don't do too much to him. So that's good. And the gargoyles in the rear and the black souls in the front kill my grotesque horde, which isn't nice. And then they turn around to face this way. So I've got two tokens there. And going into my turn six, I might only have to face one more turn after this. So I'm going to drop a token here, charge this guy into the gargoyles. They will then pick up one of the tokens. So that gives me a token. The immortal guard are in the enemy half carrying one as well. So that's worth two. I'm going to try and kill him and steal his. And these two are going to charge into the half-breeds there, and then Bracky is free to go and attack something as well. So, on to turn six for me. So there's that plan in action, drop a token, charge in, those guys shuffle across and pick up the token. The Immortal Guard and Bracky kill off the corpse wagon, and I take the token away from that, and then pivot the Immortal Guard. So they're in enemy territory, so they, uh, they're holding multiple tokens, but they can only really hold one. So it's worth two to them at the moment because they're in enemy territory and i murder that unit there as well the half breeds so they can just pick one of my units to try and kill in turn six now and token wise i've got two points there because they're in enemy territory i've got one on the wagon one on them which puts me up to four i'm not sure if this guy's across the line at the moment he might be which would give me five. My opponent has one there and one there, which is two. So unless units get shot off, I should be okay now. Because I've pivoted these guys outside of the charge arc of the board there, so they're somewhat safe. It's just a question of whether my opponent wants to charge them with the doggos or shoot them with the mortar. And where do you feel like your best chances are? So turn six for the evil at Abyssal Dwarves. Half-breeds into my half-breeds there. And hold on, what's going on there? So damage is dished out here. Uh, Bracky, these guys take some wounds. 
and the gargoyles that hit them and then allowed the horde to flank charge the corpse wagon and that gets killed as a result and loses its token my half breeds get killed there which i can live with and i think the mortars just totally missed because they chose not to go in they chose that the, the to use the mortar as the best option and that didn't hit so do we have another turn no we do not and i think we weren't actually allowed to roll for another turn because we were just running very tight on time and the venue had to close as well so we didn't roll for turn seven in this game because we were, the announcement went up this is the final round don't do any more turns and what would have happened if we did have a turn seven well you can see obviously that i've won because the immortal guard are worth two in there and i've still got one on them which means i've scored three and my opponent has one on this unit here and a unit there which is two so a win for me very nice what, what would have happened in the next turn so i think these guys would have been able to get into the front there so i could have only front charged them so those guys would have needed to live basically so i would have looked for something to block them up i don't know whether bracky could have maybe done the job there's difficult terrain there so that's going to be tricky um what would i have done this unit's dead so I I would have needed, what else could I have done here? Because I don't have any units that could go and collect this token off them if they dropped it, I don't think. They wouldn't have been able to get sufficiently out of the way. Maybe they could have done, and maybe Bracky could have tried to block them in so they couldn't charge them. So yeah, turn seven was going to look very spicy if we did get one. And could have definitely changed things. Um, I would have killed that unit probably with the grotesques, so I would have got some more kill points. So I ended up with, I believe, an 18 score out of 20 in this round, so that's nice. On to the next round. So round three, I'm on the top table, and there is one point separating the top three, and then there's a little bit of a gap down to fourth place. So if I draw or get a win, that should guarantee a podium place. In theory. So let's see. It is the Varangur, and we have three regiments of Draga, which are not that easy to put away. They've got low defense, but they can't be wavered, so expendable infantry. Some Night Raiders who have throwing axes with piercing, and they're decent on the charge as well, so a bit of an all round decent unit there. Three Mounted Sons of Corgan, standard cavalry. Two Tundra Wolves, who seem to have got some... I don't know if they've been buffed recently, because they look pretty tasty, don't they? With Thunderous Charge 1 hitting on 3s. I would compare them with Speed 9. They're kind of like Werewolves or the Night Stalker Shadowhounds. So a nice hard-hitting unit there as well. Four Magus Conclaves. So these have... Blood bolts, so it's only two attacks, but it's blast d3 with steady aim as well. 36 inch range, piercing two, so they're going to be dangerous. And then there's a magus there on a horse with inspiring talisman, drain life. Then drain life on another one, and drain life on another one. And a spellcaster, just a standard one, it's not on a horse, this one, and this one has lightning bolt six. So What's scary about this list? The fact is, at the end of the game, when your units have all been taking damage, if you haven't got into this gun line, there's so many different units that they can all spread out their fire and kill off things at the end of the game. The other issue is that they can potentially focus fire and it's difficult to shut down all of them. Now, if I could charge all of them, obviously that would be an easy way to do that, but you have to actually get close enough to do that, and they have 36 inch range. So that's going to be potentially tricky, because there's a lot of hard hitting stuff in the combat section of the army as well. So it is a fairly balanced list, it's not a pure gun line by any means. These guys are all round units, and then there are these five fast, hard hitting cavalry units as well. And it's dominate scenario, so I've taken the pictures after the scout moves as well. You can see the dominate area right there. What is my strategy here? Well, there's a lot of shooting. Do not lose the gargoyles because I need them 
to block up enemy shooting and to chaff up enemy charges because they've got the fast cavalry edge on me. I'm putting some of my good unit strength towards the middle of the table, the Immortal Guard and the Golem Horde. The Golem Horde are most resistant to shooting with their high defence, they're going to be marching forward absorbing it. And these two have unit strength 3 each, which is good for a regiment. So we'll see if they can stay in the middle at the end of the game. And I'm going to try and get something into that shooting area. I'm not just going to march in there with all my units and just let them shoot me. I'm going to try and send some tricky stuff in there, maybe get into the woods first. And yeah, that's the plan. I'm going to have to use my Abyssal Halfbreed Champions to block off a lot of charges from the cavalry, as well as the gargoyles, as I advance. So, my opponent has some decent speed on this side. That is actually a... A, some kind of big hero on a monster, which I don't think I read on the list. But it's not the super powerful one. It's like a step down. It's just a Thane, I think. So, into the middle, and you can see there's the gun line. That's the lightning bolt guy there. Those are all the major conclaves. There's the corpse wagon for the enemy forces there. And more speed on this side. Right, turn one for me. I believe my opponent chose to give me, give me the first turn. So I advance up with this guy, who is clearly bait. It's obviously, I'm not trying to disguise it, I'm just throwing him out there. If you want to charge him, then come on, and then I'll hit you with something else. It's pretty simple. But he's expensive enough, and his nerve is low enough, so that people might think, I'll gobble up those points. So if you leave him dangling out there, maybe people take it. But here's the misleading thing about half-breed champions. People look at them and they see 12 as the nerve. They see 12, 14 and they think, that is a low nerve. Because I think if the first number is below 14, I consider that a low nerve unit. If it's above 14, I consider that a high nerve unit, or at least a medium to high. And then super high would be like your big hordes of infantry, which are like 21 plus. So the fact that it's 12, 14, I think tricks people into thinking that it's easy to kill. What you should really be doing, if you're going to be charging it, is looking at it as a flat 14 on defence 5. Because if you waver it, it's got fury. So just ignore the fact that it has a 12 in there. Just look at the 14 and suddenly you think, actually, that's not the easiest target to go and kill. Essentially dash 14 in combat with defence 5. So. Yes, and for shooting them off, generally being individual, that can deter people as well. So I think these, people underestimate them. Bracky has advanced a bit as well. I don't want to get shot to death, and I don't want to get in their charge range yet. So, just moving up a bit. I've thrown two half-breed champions out on the left. Because if you want to come and charge them, that's fine. If you charge them with chaff or cruddy units, I can put gargoyles on you and the Grotesque Champions. If you charge them with anything good, then I've got these two as well. So, whatever you want to do. If you do nothing, I will just charge something with them, and then you'll be pinned. So you have to deal with them, kind of. And... I think my Hex Caster Hex is one of the wizards as well. Turn one for the enemy. So, okay, I don't think I told you about this one on the list either, or this one. You know what, I'm going to go back to the enemy list, because there's just a piece I missed, I think. A piece of the list that I bypassed. Where is it? Down, oh yeah, I didn't go down far enough here. So it's Magnild of the Fallen, who is a... It's an infantry character, but it can fly once per game, I think. So it does have wings, but it can't unfurl them at all times. And then the two Thanes on Frostfangs, yeah, so there we go. So, where were we? Here we go. So, actually, let's make it a double charge with the wolves in there as well. And I'm not too disappointed about that because I've got en enough chaff to block them in. I can be charging my grotesque champions into these units to stop them coming through as well. Gargoyles to land there, which leaves my half-breeds and my grotesques to hit these units. And if this one ends up in front, I can charge that and then overrun maybe into the wolves, and this one, if he get, doesn't get the kill, maybe there's a multi-charge option available because of the angles here. They're not 
like right up against each other. So I'm not feeling too sad about this situation. Even if they both die, I think I'm in a good position to hit things, which is what I want to do. The Thane on Frostfang on this side goes for this champion, who was kind of the bait there. These dudes, I keep wanting to call them Hunters. I think that's in the Northern Alliance list they're called Hunters, but they're basically the same kind of thing. I can't remember what they're called now. And these two are staying out of range of them, which is wise. You don't want to get hit by the half-breeds, especially these ones have got the boots of striding while you're in difficult terrain, and they've got the speed edge, so why would they? Okay, let's see what damage is dished out. So from all the shooting, damage onto the golems, which I can live with, and damage onto them, which I'm not as happy about, but they do have regen. And look at this. So the Magnild and... The wolves, 9 damage, but they only get a waiver on this guy. So they do inspire themselves as well. So on average, I would probably expect this one to die, but the fact that he's not dead has opened up a very interesting possibility for me, which I will point you to on the next wide shot of this situation. 2 damage done to him, so he's okay. 3 damage done to him, so he's okay on the right flank. So what is the interesting situation, I hear you ask? The half-breed champion can now counter charge. This guy has to just get out of the way. But because he's he's an individual, he can look kind of this way and charge one of those units, locking down one of them. The two grotesque champions can charge into the other unit, which means that the grotesques and this guy can double charge the Magnild. If they then kill it and overrun, one unit would go into each. So the Grotesques would go into the Thane, who I would expect to die as a result of that, and the Halfbreed Champion would overrun into the Wolves, who would just take away their Thunderous Charge. So that's the plan. I'm going to sacrifice one unit of Gargoyles to land in front of those Knights as well, because there is a gap just big enough for them to land in there. So if you want to stop this kind of behaviour, Gargoyles landing, blocking in your units, you can put yourself closer so that there's nowhere for them to land to block you, but then obviously you open yourself up to other charges like boom from down here. So I understand staying at a range. It's just very difficult to deal with all these individuals and fast flying chaff units. It's difficult to play the game you want. They've got a good level of control with it. Turn two. Okay, this is hilarious. Gargoyles that were here because these grotesques move out of the way so the gargoyles can charge over there into the wolves in difficult terrain, hindered charge, do a, a few wounds, and then roll an 11 on the nerve and kill them. So that's great. Because there's no inspiring over here. Which I put my uh, put Bracky in that position there, which is going to stop those units up there from coming down here into the grotesques. <clears throat> and keeps this unit safe as well. So they're in a position to strike next turn. Here, the grotesques and... Uh, the Grotesque went into the front of that unit, and the Corpse Wagon into the flank. I did seven wounds, and double one them. So obviously that's not a lot of damage anyway. I would have hoped to do a lot more than that with the Grotesques, but double one anyway. And then I don't kill there. So because that is a failure, that means that this guy now has a rear charge into the Grotesques, which could be very bad. I don't waver him either. Over here, what's this? Twelve wounds onto the Magnil from these two, with Dread. A brutal, should I say, and then double one that as well. Well, the unit I was relying on dying so that I've got this one inch overrun into both enemy units, which pretty much, in my opinion, secures this flank for the rest of the game as mine, has now gone and rolled a double one. <sighs> now, this is an all your eggs in one basket type situation. I didn't need to do this at all, so I could have countercharged there. I could have charged the Grotesques just into this one, and I could have put Half-Breeds in there. So that was an option. I just wanted to put less units in harm's way, and I felt this was a very efficient way of doing it. And you can't always factor in the double one. And very sad, but there you go, double one. These guys are alive after being charged by this Half-Breed champ who got out of the way over there to make space for this shenanigan. And then the two grotesque champions team up to kill the other unit. And one of them turns on its flank to protect the flank of this one from the knights up here. 
So there's the wide shot. I've still got lots of heavy hitters left, but this is very bad. So if I'd managed to lock this unit down with no thunderous charge, overrun and killed him, these knights would have had to think, if we kill the gargoyles, we now get charged by grotesques, and this whole area would have just been looking really healthy. And I could then start working towards the middle to support this lot. This flank I'm quite happy with, apart from this situation that I've given this rear charge up. And really, I was hoping to just kill that unit with all these attacks and then just turn around and face this guy who is a big threat. And those guys were going to be prevented from charging because of the gargoyles being in there and this guy blocking. So they could charged through into the flank but they'd have to kill Bracky out of difficult terrain which is very difficult indeed. So it's still up in the air but that is a big moment and I was thinking going into the just before rolling dice for combat I really like the way this table looks now I feel like I'm in a strong position but that could be undermining things so let's find out what happens next. Turn two for the Varangur so a flank charge there from the doggos into him, which doesn't really do anything for them, but it does mean that they can overrun into the grotesques if they do kill him. Which they may well do, because nothing hit them last turn, so they have their thunderous. Magnild and the Thane charge into the grotesques in the front. The Sons of Corgan into the gargoyles. The Draugr get into the action now. These are very cool units here. Possibly my favourite units in the army I'm up against here in terms of models. Very, very nice. Ghouls. And they go into, uh, I think it's the this one here, the front. Because then the corpse wagon goes into the flank of this one. And the Cloak of Death dishes out some wounds around the place, just for a bit of generosity. And these guys come to charge the grotesques, and he goes into the rear of them, as you'd expect. Gargoyles are hit by the cavalry up there in retaliation for them murdering the wolves up there as well, which is a fair retaliation, I would say. These knights just angling themselves out of range of the obsidian golems, which is a good idea. So, a bit of damage done there, not much. Bit of damage done, bit of damage done. The golems are shot off the table by the Magus Conclaves. The Halfbreed Chump is killed by the Wolves, who then steam over into the Grotesques, and they um, accumulate a load of wounds as well, and they die. So, that is the swing. I was hoping these two units would be dead, and this one would be locked down. Whereas now, all three of them are alive, and I've lost two units there. So, wow, wow, wow. The power of the double one. Even at 3,000 points, it can still make a big difference. So what lesson can you take from that? I would say, if you have a really devilish plan that leaves you in a horrible position if you roll the double one, then maybe rethink it. Maybe don't put all your eggs in one basket and plan ahead because this is a dice game. So what is your plan if the dice go horribly and you fail miserably and you roll a double one? What is happening next? Do you get whooped as a result of that? Or are you in a position where you can still defend yourself a bit? Something to consider there. Risk versus reward. I felt the reward was very high, but the risk, as you can see, was also high. And the odds of failing were very low, but still, it was a high risk in terms of the, the negatives if it fail. It's going to be bad. Bad times for all. So gargoyles take a load of wounds and then get double wand. Yay! So it swings back a little bit there and the gargoyles are still locking them down for a turn. In the middle, some more damage is dished out, but not enough. And then a fake double one here. So not a true double one, but taking pictures of anyway, because I think this table is cursed. And these grotesques take some uh, good damage from the rear charge and they get killed as well. So at this point I'm thinking, this is not looking good. Both the flanks are not going the way I want, the gargoyles get killed there as well. Now, at this point my opponent was thinking that surely I'm going to charge there, use my boots and try and kill the knights. But what I'm looking at is the fact that they are facing this way, which means their arc of sight goes down here. So, 
I don't have to worry about them because he's looking that way as well. So if I just charge past them, I can leave them both facing this way with no one to charge. That is my plan because I want to get to the center. It's dominate, so I don't have to worry about them right now. And I've got things that can deal with them later. So what I'm going to do is declare a triple charge with them, Bracky, this unit here, all three of them into this. So in the middle, what am I going to do? Because it's looking a bit unhealthy because of this situation, but there are things I can do. I've got gargoyles to block. I've got this champion to block. My two grotesque champions are still in the middle of a fight. The immortal guard I don't think can see anyone right now. And I'm still going to be able to do some charges though. So uh, Bracky actually has to go into this unit here because I want to take away their thunderous. And then I do charge everyone into that unit and murder them. Now, this, if I was trying to argue a point, it could have been contentious, but on the other hand, it would be, it, there would be no right for me to make it a contentious point, and I'll explain why. So here's the situation. I checked the arc of this unit, which went down like here. And when I charged in, the line of the charge was on about here. So... There was enough space between the laser here and the edge of all my units in the triple charge that any amount of pivoting I do should keep them safe from this unit. However, all I declared at the time was that when they do the charge, they are out of arc of this unit. Put the laser down to show it. Yep, confirmed. At no point did I confirm after I kill and then start wiggling, I'm still out of arc. I didn't clarify that part of it, which means that after combat, when I started rotating units, this unit somehow, because let's see where the unit is. You can see the front of the unit would be on top of these rocks here, which puts it there. So there's no way that it can actually physically end up here because it pivoted on the spot and didn't go backwards. So it's just me being sloppy with a, a pivoting of the unit after combat or it slid off a rock or something and ended up an inch further back because when we get the laser out we can actually see that it's well into their arc like not even close like over a centimeter so i i thought wait that's just wild how can that happen because i i checked there was no way that i could even end up in your arc so i looked at the pictures saw that it should actually be here but then i thought you know what that is where the unit ended up and if i've just sloppily pivoted them accidentally too far backwards which they shouldn't have been able to do but that's where I've put them, that's where the unit is, and the turn has begun with them in that position. I didn't do the pivot and then declare, look, I'm still out. So I decided, you know what, I'm not going to put that on my opponent, I'm just going to say, you can have that charge, because that's just me not being careful positioning them after combat. So it should really be about here, but that is entirely my fault for just not pivoting it correctly and putting it in the right place after the fight. So they are going to have a charge on the corpse wagon. My gargoyles, you can see, charged in and shut down one of these major conclaves and blocked the line of sight, some of them as well, slightly. And chucked a load of other things into combat. I was hoping to kill this unit because then I could turn and face this way and not get flanked by this Thane, who I've not really got fully blocked because I've got a half-breed camp charging him. If I wanted to block him, I don't know whether I could have physically done it, whether I could have put him sideways in here and then hope to avoid an overrun. He doesn't have that many attacks, so the chance of overrunning through him aren't that high. So is there space I could have put in there to stop him getting into the flank? Maybe. And I've put my mortal guard up into the woods. They can see, so they can start joining in the fight. The gargoyles have locked down the wolves there. Gargoyles who got double wand are still locking down those knights. So all good there. But no damage done to the wolves, which is annoying because they still get their thunderous now. Although they would kill the gargoyles anyway. Okay. Turn three for my opponent, so that charge is then possible because of my uh, weird positioning of this unit. So he's going to die. This guy does take the flank there because I didn't do a very good round of attacks against these guys, didn't kill them, wasn't able to turn around, and didn't do a good enough job blocking him off. I should also point out actually that even though technically we're only halfway through the game, the tournament was running quite long and the venue would shut, so we were told. There isn't that long left, guys, so hurry up. 
So you will notice in the last couple of turns, there is not a lot of thoughts put into some of the moves because I was kind of rushing through. I think the last turn I forgot all my regeneration because I was just in a rush to get it done so we could try and finish the game in the allocated time because the venue would just close. So we would have to just walk out and pack up our armies on the street. Uh, probably. Maybe they wouldn't have made us do that, but I'm sure it wouldn't have been uh, very fun for the, the people running the shop. And this was at the outpost, by the way, in Sheffield. So, charges in there. The grotesque champions are holding up quite well to this assault. There's Draugr attacking that one and the Corpse Wagon attacking this one. And three damage dished out here because the Magnild charges in there. And let's have a look at what happens as a result of all this now then. So, three damage done to this unit. That was with a bit of shooting. They take, they're up to seven damage now. Not wavy though, you can see a laser in action there, can't you? Checking on some lines of sight and some arcs there. Bit of damage done down here, not much. Not much at all. Gargoyles get wavered. Uh, in front of the Magus Conclaves. Corpse Wagon does get killed. And they then turn round, so I can see them. And some damage done there, but not enough. He does get wavered, so he's going to be able to fight still. The gargoyles get killed by the wolves. The other gargoyles get killed by those knights. And this unit, up to nine. But, yeah, that flank charge not looking too fatal at the moment. Okay, grotesque champion. He took five wounds. So with dread from this guy, that puts it up to six. So that requires an 11 twice on the dice to kill him. And what do you think was rolled on the dice? 11 twice. So Grotesque Champion killed by the Corpse Wagon with a double 11. So that's annoying. And so this unit surviving the flank charge is obviously nice though. So that's a bonus. And what am I going to do on my turn now? So my turn four. We may not have too many more turns after this, so... Oh, running out of time, what can I do? I'm not feeling too confident scenario-wise, but I do have these guys that are good unit strength in here, so I just need to try and kill as much as possible and leave myself open to as little as possible. Turn four. Half-breed camp into the enemy uh, caster there. In fact... What happened is... Who was there? Let me go back. So I think I kill this one with him because he was already heavily damaged and then overrun into that guy but don't kill it. And they counter charge him because that means that the Grotesque Champion then has space to flank charge this unit here. And I do make a mistake here though. Because we're running short on time, I'm not necessarily thinking all my moves through the most. So there's definitely some uh, brain being left on the table here. These, this guy charges into the flank there and because he's gone right up to the edge of this unit he can now be flanked by those knights so all I had to do is just go backwards except being flank charged by this unit that's not very good at fighting which would have gone fine probably and he would have been safer but instead I leave him facing forwards to avoid the flank from them not spotting the fact that they can just turn around and charge him in the flank now because he's right up to the edge of the unit so that's what happens when you're in a rush, folks. You make mistakes. Which you see when people start getting towards the end of their clock as well, they start to make mistakes. So, combat's going on here, raging on, doing some decent damage. And... You can see that that guy runs away in my opponent's turn there. And there's this sandwich I was talking about. So they were able to get on this flank now, which was kind of avoidable. And you can see that the Immortal Guard actually joined in with the combat there as well. So when we get into the Baron Gur turn, that flank charge goes in. Wolves get into the half-breeds there. We've got Draw get into the flank of the Gargoyles, who are around the gun line. And 
Uh, this guy is doing some spell casting. You can see that they've taken some wounds. There's a lot of drain life going off, which is why the enemy units are healing as well, and mine are taking wounds. Up to 12. The Immortal Guard take a million shooting attacks as well. And so does this guy. I think he takes... He might take a bit of drain life as well. So that unit's dead. That unit's dead. And it's not looking very healthy. Let's see who's alive after all this. The half-breeds are dead. The grotesque champion's dead. So at this point, it's definitely game over because there's no way back from here. I don't have enough in the middle to contest the objective. And it was a very rapid decline. So it was looking really good at one point. I was feeling very good about the positioning on the board. I thought I'm in a position to trade some units quite well. I've still got lots of chaff left to block the enemy up. But it all went downhill. And then adding on to that the fact that we were in such a rush to get the game finished, so we start making moves without necessarily thinking them through all the way because we're in such a hurry. And uh, that's going to be it. Yep, so that's the end of the game. We only get through four turns before the cry went up of this is the last turn, folks. We still had a good 20 or 30 minutes each left on our clock, I think. So... I think some of the previous rounds run a bit long, maybe, and yeah, there you go. So had there been another turn, what would have we have been able to accomplish? So I would have probably killed this unit because they're heavily damaged. This guy might have been able to finish off an enemy unit, maybe one of these two, but then in the Varangor turn, they would have certainly killed my one scoring unit in the middle. So there was no way I was actually going to win the game from here. I would have got some more kills by going first in turn five and then probably would have lost most of my army. So I would have got slightly more points out of the occasion, which would have been nice. But as you can see, winner of the best painted award. Bum, 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 bum. Lovely trophy. And it also there was a miniature as well. Where is it? I've got it around here somewhere. It's a Reaper Bones Fire Demon, and it's in its pack, so I can't see what it's going to look like, so I'll probably Google that to see what it's supposed to look like, but it looks pretty cool. It looks very demon-like, so I'll have to figure out what to do with that. And also, there was a bottle of some kind of, some kind of, like, cooking sauce or something as well. It may well be the same one uh, that I got last time at this event, where I only got a tiny one, which was for winning the, the best special event character. But it's a, a large bottle this time. So I'll have to look into whether that's something that's tasty. It must be if he's just giving away bottles of it, trying to spread the word of this delicious, allegedly product. So very nice event. It was really fun playing 3000 point games. I'm not the kind of person that gets gaming fatigue during an event, so uh, these really big, complicated, convoluted games are perfect for me, especially with this army I'm playing as well. It allows me to play in a really a chess-like manner. I've got lots of very sneaky pieces that I can put around in places that are difficult to deal with, and I can stop you from making the moves that you think are the best, hopefully. I can keep my units safe with all the chaff I've got. I can do damage with some of my chaff units as well, using the half-breed champions as chaff. Once you get them into combat, like I said, they're essentially dash 14 at that point, on defense five, so they're a lot tougher than they initially look. And yeah, it's a very good list, I think. I think this Varangur list was very good as well, two very good lists. And the reason so much stuff got killed at the end was all the little shooting attacks that I mentioned earlier. So there's so many of them, and I never really got to shut them down. So because this flank went so horribly, and this flank, this one was more my fault, I would say, because not killing that unit, even though I was hoping to kill them, it wasn't by any means a guarantee. It wasn't like a double one when they were over their nerve threshold or anything. So... That one's more on me on this side. On this side, it was more on putting all the eggs in one basket, leading to a double one, which then meant that this unit were then able to then do a load of sweeping up, which contributed to my downfall. And I lost multiple units over there that could have been helping. So yeah, I was really confident. 
after a couple of turns. I thought it was looking really good. It was a very good game overall. Lots of nice moves done on both sides, I thought. Some very cool positions found, some very sneaky maneuvers pulled off. Very nice game indeed. Three great games. And I think this list is quite spicy. I'm not going to be able to use it again, because there won't be any more 3,000 point events. But there is a 1995 point event tomorrow, which I am attending. And I'm using Abyssal Dwarves as well, but obviously it's not this list. So a little bit different, and I'm hoping to do that report when I get home tomorrow evening as well. And I have booked Monday off work for the record, so I'm not a total beast. And that is going to be fun. So I need to take a few units out of my carry case, out of my backpack, since I don't need 3,000 points worth for tomorrow. And you can look forward to seeing that report as well. Let me know what you think about the, any of these games, any of the tactics that we used, any of the army lists, and what do you think about the future of Abyssal Dwarves? I think this is a very strong list archetype, with lots of gargoyles and half-breed champions. I think those are very strong units at the moment, and the hard-hitting stuff, the grotesques and the half-breeds, I think are juicy as well, and running this kind of list allows you to protect them quite well. So yeah, I think the future is bright for the Abyssal Dwarves. There is still something to be said for the big golem horde, the loads of golems and greater golems and iron casters as well, I think. But I'm having a lot of fun with this kind of list at the moment. So I'm going to keep running it for the time being. Two Kings of War events back to back. You can't get a more Kings of War-y weekend than that. Two separate events. So let's leave it resting on this image as I bask in the glory. The final standings haven't gone up yet, so I'm guessing I probably finished 4th or 5th. Which is fine by me. It's the first ranked event I've actually done this season, because I only went to the Masters. So two ranked events in one weekend, and then I've got another one. When's the next one? Let me check my tournament calendar here. So I've got a Warhammer event in a couple of weeks, and the next Kings of War is the next one I'm actually signed up for is July, I think. So if I can spot any more before then, I'll definitely look into those as well. There is usually one at BritCon, and I think that's usually in June or July or August. I'm not sure. Sometime around the summer, isn't it? It might be August, actually. So it might actually be after the one in July. So keep my eyes peeled though, so if anyone knows of any Kings of War events that are within striking distance of Nottingham, preferably one dayers, then let me know, because I'm always looking for more. And I'm enjoying playing a lot of different game systems at tournaments. And thankfully I'm one of those people that can kind of segment the different game systems inside my brain and they don't merge into each other. So I'm not playing Kings of War and accidentally trying to use a rule from Warhammer Fantasy, for example. So that's lucky because I'm hoping to play this year like five or six different game systems at tournaments. And that is my goal going forward, just to keep playing tournaments, all different game systems, having fun, painting armies, living the dream. So don't forget to like and subscribe, obviously, if you've enjoyed this content. Don't forget to check out all the links in the description, including all the social media shenanigans, Twitter, Facebook, Discord server, and all that stuff. The Discord server has been broken up into sections now, so there is just a Kings of War page if you want to talk about that in there. And don't forget, obviously, that if you want to keep this channel afloat during these dark, turbulent times as, as the beacon of hobby, joy, and fulfillment, and education, then why not pledge your entire life savings to the Patreon or the PayPal down there as well. Why not? Because that will help me go to a million tournaments instead of just 900,000. How about that? Okay, it's time to wrap this one up. Over two hours, I think that's pretty good for three games. Hopefully you got some spice out of this one. Let me know also if you spotted any rules being played incorrectly, if you spotted anything that you think was a mistake. And all that remains to be said is... Good night out there. Whatever you are.